Sassy Jack Stitchery is sponsoring this week's show with Susan Fay Shower John. The new shop is on track to open in a couple of weeks, so start making your travel plans. On the Sassy Jack's Facebook page, Kim recently showed a band sampler that is going to be the focus of a March workshop. It's stunning, and you're going to want to be part of it. Sassy Jack's also has the popular Needlework Press 2024 Book of Days available for pre-order. Those books sell out quickly, so act now to secure your copy. There's much more going on at Sassy Jack's, and you can keep up with all of it through the Sassy Jack's website, sassyjackstitchery.com, the Jack's Journal newsletter, or the Sassy Jack's Facebook page. Get your name on the list so you don't miss out. Thanks to Sassy Jack Stitchery, and now our conversation with Susan Faye Shower John. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week. Susan Fay Shower John from SFS Fiber Art Studio. Susan, welcome. Thank you. And, so, and also the, the partner for the, the Spiralis Gallery with Gail Patterson. So you guys just signed the lease on that. We did. We did. We've, um, we've decided that our work really, um, although we represent different artists, um, we're both very contemporary and want to bring in a fresh new contemporary art gallery to our area. And so we are sharing the space and she has the spiralis gallery and my gallery is called the zebra gallery oh okay all right so uh, so for those who don't know susan or gail patterson was our guest last week and we talked about the spiralis gallery and then uh, uh now so you guys are full partners so tell us how this is all going to work out now because we didn't <laughs> we did we didn't talk about you yeah <laughs> so so fill us in on the other side of it how is this all going to work out with your art and gail's uh curation and collection of haitian art yes. i mean this this is uh this is a most interesting conglomeration of things here i think it is i think we uh you know gail came up to me at a, at a, the first art show i had ever done with my current fiber work and said you know you should you should be in the smithsonian show and I, I didn't know her from anyone, and I didn't know about the Smithsonian Show. And I went ahead and applied and got in that, that first year and just had a great show. And she came up to me at the show and said, I don't suppose you remember me. And I said, I remember you. You're the person who told me to apply to this show. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> and um, so we've been kind of buds ever since then. But literally, that was in May. So we have just gotten to know each other recently and we were out having a drink together and she was telling you about a gallery she wanted to open. And I had been looking at gallery space um, as well. And we we were literally at at um, a tavern that looked out on a gallery space that was available. And we looked at each other, and said, is there any way that we, we hardly know each other? <laughs> but. <laughs> Could we do this? And we have been talking ever since. And she has the most incredible artists that she represents. Oh, and, yeah. um, and our work is my work is not uh, quite the same as hers. I think there's there's a distinction between the style. But um, but I think it will all work in a very large gallery where we've got lots of space. So um, so I am going to have my work in that gallery as well as a number of other artists okay so then uh, you've got uh this this space uh, you know how many deals have been put together over a drink at a bar you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> it always starts out well right yeah but so so how is this gallery going to work how much space do you have uh is I, I assume now it's just all white walls and you're getting ready to put it together exactly it's all white walls we've got all the the lighting white lighting <laughs> and spotlight set up Today, we're hanging all the white um, picture hanging system around all the walls so that we won't need to put holes in the walls. We'll hang the work um, from a cable system, and that's all going in today. I'm not very good with square footage, but it's a rather large space with three separate um, gallery rooms and each is separated by a small staircase so they kind of you can walk from one gallery space up some stairs into the next gallery space and up some stairs into another gallery space so i think that that division really is is going to be kind of charming 
Yeah, so that that means then you can have three very distinct exhibits and and a defined space for them rather than just one big long hall. Precisely. Oh yeah, yeah. So then then now uh, Gail's Gail's vast collection and all the people she she represents, and then your art in there, and then we're going to have other exhibits, and and we're going to rotate, or how are we going to do this? Yes. So every ten weeks, we've decided that we are going to change out the show just like they would in a New York gallery, keep things fresh. After 10 weeks, we change out um, I my work and my the other artists that I'm working with, I have five other artists in my uh, gallery, will take over, will we'll completely switch our spaces so that the gallery just completely remains fresh all the time. So when someone comes in, if they come in a couple of months later, there's an entirely new show, and it's it's all changed around. So um, that's how we're going to do it every 10 weeks. That is so cool. So people who are within uh, driving distance then can really kind of make a, an every 10-week journey to the gallery and see a whole new deal. That's neat. Yes, yeah. And come and get, you know, wine and cheese every 10 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Now, and you mentioned about the hanging system, and it got me thinking about setting up a gallery, because when we walk in, we see art hanging on walls, and but but the lighting, the hanging, uh, UV light, all those things get to be factors as you're getting this set up. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. yep. Um, but we, but Gail um, had a gallery in New Jersey some years ago, and so she, she has some experience, and I have at least a modicum of experience doing um, shows like the Smithsonian show where I had to take my own displays and my own lighting. So we both have some experience with it, and uh, we're, we're both in our mid-60s and said, if we're ever going to do this, why wouldn't we do it now? So we kind of have leapt right into it. <laughs> hey, why not? <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Now you said you represent other artists too. What? Because uh, yes. you're so multifaceted. I mean, we should tell people: uh, wood turning, oil, uh, colored pencil, and and then uh, the the textile arts. Holy smokes! I, I can't wait to get to that part of it. Um, that that you do, but then you yes. represent others. I do. Um, the really the work that I sh- that I share with people now is the the work that I do in fiber. And um, the other work is kind of, kind of past work. I mean, I don't mind. I, I, I still teach wood turning. I still teach colored pencil. But I, um, I really think that the work that I show and that I put my name on these days is my fiber work. And so I will be showing my fiber work. But in addition, this gallery is large enough that I really thought the zebra gallery needed more than one artist involved. And, and to give people, you know, some options for like ceramics and mosaic and um, some abstract work. So I've been in the art world long enough to have some people. I just always in the back of my mind thought if ever I were going to have a gallery, I sure would want them. And uh, I've been lucky enough that that each one that I reached out to has said they were on board. So Mm. it's been very, very uh, serendipitous. Okay, so and that helps with another question that is not just going to be stuff hanging on walls and frames then. We're going to have uh, other kinds of art. Yes, yeah, they'll they'll be it'll be mostly work that hangs on a wall, but we're going to do some work that'll be on pedestals or tables, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is exciting. <laughs> That's really great. Thank you. So, Thank yeah. you. We're excited. Oh, I'm sure you are. Yeah. Uh, a lot of work, but um, uh, yeah, and we talked to um, to Gail last week a- after the show about doing some uh, some video tours once you guys Absolutely. get set up. So we'd love that. Yeah, looking forward to that. And if you're going to do it every ten weeks, uh, sign me up. Okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm all about that. Uh, well, it, it, I mean, it's you know that's the thing with a gallery is. Uh, only so many people can get there. Of course, being on the East Coast, that's a huge amount of people. But um, uh, when when we address textile art and needlework uh, from around the world, you know, it's yes. it's nice to be able to expose people from uh, who can't get there. Uh, yes, so. and and my hope is 
I'm in discussion with two other fiber artists, one from South Africa and one from Poland. And so I hope to have work that is not, you know, thoroughly dissimilar from mine, but has its own style um, of, of fiber work, you know, machine, freehand machine thread work. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. So you guys, so that's the other thing is that from what I'm hearing here, uh, you guys are starting out and the, the floodgates are, are holding back an awful lot of art then. I, I think, I think so. I, th and I don't know if it's simply because of the kind of work that we like, which is, um, work that is, is meaningful and has, um, history to it and has, you know, um, has something more to say that we are living, we live near the Chesapeake Bay and near DC and the galleries near us are, um, really kind of based on sailboats and, uh, you know, Hudson, Hudson river Valley kind of paintings. And we just wanted to bring a little bit of splash to it. And, um, and so I think, yeah, I think that the floodgates have opened only because that work is out there and, and, um, is looking for a place to be represented. So we, if anything, we need to be cautious about, <laughs> you know, about not making too many promises. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I can, I can see the, the, the list is long and you get, get ahead of yourself in a hurry here. Indeed. Yeah. And I don't want to let anyone down. Yeah. So. Now, it's so interesting that you guys haven't known each other that long and you come together because Gail, an anesthesiologist, and then <laughs> then your background is biology and neuroscience. I mean, that's what you studied originally. Yeah. Did you make a career of that? or I did, I did not. Um, I was really, really interested in... Um, you did all that work and just went into art? <laughs> Pretty much. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, you can ask my parents whether that was okay with them. Actually, they were always very supportive. But um, I, uh, I was at Princeton and I was studying um, brain aging, which was a fascinating subject. I'm still thoroughly interested in it. But I realized that um, you know, I was in the graduate program and my, my brother was uh, had already graduated from Harvard and had his degree in genetics and had a huge lab at University of Texas at Austin. And I looked up to him. He was the smart one. And um, he, at, at when it was time for tenure to come around in that University of Texas system, the year that he came up for tenure, it was denied. Um, it was denied to everybody for financial reasons. Mm, and so ouch. here he was, you know, older than me, a family, you know, of five. And all of a sudden, you know, the one I thought was really the one who should be a scientist was now looking for a job. And so it did make me kind of rethink whether or not I wanted to stay in science um, or maybe take a break. So I literally did just that. I took a two week break and took my windsurfer off the wall, which was in the lab at Princeton and and drove down to visit friends on the Chesapeake Bay and spent two weeks out of my windsurfer in 1986 and um, just met a bunch of cool people. And I thought, you know, I'm going to take a year off. And so I took a year off and, and decided uh, not to go back. Hmm. But I love, you know, it's I, I love that I've had that experience and I and I certainly love that I know enough to to find all that information that's coming out now really interesting. Yeah, we're not going to have a conversation with your parents about um, the, the money they spent on education. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky for them, I got a few, I got a few grants. So they, they uh, but yeah, they were always supportive. Yeah, well, and, and your, your dad, uh, an artist, so it, you had, were you torn? I mean. Um, no, not, it's funny. So my father is an, is an artist um, at heart, and he's an artist now at age 97, doing watercolor. Wow! But he, but he always did it as a hobby. He uh -huh. never made a living doing it. And I was raised um, to believe that you don't do art as a living, and so I was never encouraged to do art alone. So, Susan, get a real job, huh? <laughs> Completely. And coming from a man with his talent, you know, it, it was kind of foreboding. So, yeah, so I always had other things that I did and have just always kind of done art on the side. And now that I'm old enough and, and far enough along, I'm really happy to do just art. 
Yeah. So so this year you take off, then you it just clarifies your head, and you just say, "All right, I've got to. I have to pursue this art thing." Yes. Yeah. Wow. Man, that's bold. That's bold. <laughs> <laughs> It is bold, but you know, life is, life is funny that way. And, um, sometimes you just have to, you know, stand with your surfboard at the, at the side of the, the ocean and say, which wave am I going to hop on? And then it's going to take you wherever it's going to take you. I, um, I say that because I just, at the same time I was making this decision to start the gallery, um, I was diagnosed with cancer Ugh. and I thought, well, isn't this timing um, interesting. So I felt it was just a nudge for me to realize my, you know, mortality, which all of us have. And, and it was just kind of a reminder that maybe if you've always wanted to do this, maybe it's time. Yeah. So I'm, I'm pleased to say I'm three weeks out of surgery and, um, they got all the cancer. And so I'm, I'm feeling good. So, you know, I'm just grateful to be here. Good for you. That's great. Yeah. No, I, I've mentioned this many times. Uh, one of my favorite comedians, Mark Maron, uh, uh, who is, uh, I mean, he's, he's brilliant, but you have to get past an awful lot of language. But um, he does a bit about, I don't know how much time I have left. You know, do yes. you want to do this or you should do this or you should do that? I don't know. I don't know how much time I have left. And no, I'm not interested. And you, know, you just spoke it right there. Yep. Yeah. 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 Um, and again, I'm just grateful. You know, I, as a kid, you don't think you're going to, I don't know, 63, I'm 63, seems so old. And, and to get here and realize, no, I still have tons of energy and I still have a hundred things I want to do. And so um, now is the time. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, uh, you got to jump on it. You absolutely exactly. have to jump on it. Yep. So, yeah, yeah. so then, then you say, all right, I'm going to do art, but then you, you did some study with people, uh, with Robert Liberace and James Plum, you, you did some work. I mean, so there's some formal training, but did you just have like from your dad and just it's in the genes kind of talent? I I think that my ability to see and represent what I see uh, has always been come pretty naturally. Um, so I don't know otherwise. I can look at something and draw it. Ah. Um, and but over the years, while I was doing other things, running some small businesses over the years, I was always doing art on the side and I did study with um, so a couple of remarkable realistic painters and Liberace being one that did portraiture and James Plum that does really um, kind of European old, old Italian kind of realistic floral paintings. And so I learned the basis or the basics from them about how to do realism in paint mm -hmm. and I've, that's what I've done kind of on and off for years except for the wood turning which got through in there for a while um and so when it literally this I just started this thread painting when COVID hit when COVID hit I thought <laughs> COVID I, I'll tell you it's so many <laughs> I know we, we we all did a rethink yep yeah yeah um and so I thought gosh I had a sewing machine and I and I, I knew I could draw, and I thought, well, why don't I just draw with my sewing machine? So that's that's kind of the impetus for how my work started out. So so it starts out with fabric collage as the values from light to dark in an image. And then when I sew, I just sew the realism back into the piece. That's how I see it. I don't think of it, I feel like I'm painting. I think of the thread as paint. If I think of it as sewing, I'd probably be intimidated because I don't really know how to use a sewing machine. <laughs> but but I just use the straight stitch and move you know the fabric freely underneath, and that way I just think of it as painting, and um, and that feels familiar. Yeah, that, that's an interesting thought. Uh, when you take a sewing machine and then you take a seamstress who makes clothes or or, or whatever. And then someone like who you, where it's just a tool for art. Yeah. It's you know the same tool and primarily designed to sew clothes, but, <laughs> but it becomes this art piece. Uh, I, I got to tell you, I had my grandson in my lap the other day sitting at my sewing machine, and he saw all these cool buttons and patterns, and he said, Nana, let's do this one. I said, honey, I don't know how those buttons work. 
I just know one button, the straight stitch, you know? <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Don't so, play with those. I'll, I'll never yeah, get yeah, it back. No, he'll have to learn that on his own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this, um, so, so the painting and the colored pencil, it amazes me what colored pencil people can do because, you know, you, you look at colored pencils and growing up going through school or whatever, never think of those as a, an, an art medium where you could do serious art. Indeed. And then there you, you know, you, you're one of you know, many examples of people who can take colored pencils and you look at the art and that, there's no way that's colored pencil. Uh, is that hard yeah. to do? It isn't, and it's what it's when I teach colored pencil. It's the all I'm doing really is teaching technique. Um, you know, when we did that, I always thought of colored pencil the way you do, which is you know we all had a set of eight colored pencils in, in grade school, <laughs> right. and we, yeah. we did our maps, you know, right. geography, um, and we colored everything in and with these you know stubby little pencils, and that's what I thought colored pencil was. But but in fact, if you use good colored pencil and good paper and use a very, very fine point to the, to the pencil, you can layer pencil on top of each other. And so particularly for things like skin or hair, when you want to show a depth of color, you actually are putting 10 to 12 different colors, different pencils on top of each other huh. before you fill in the entire tooth of the paper. You have to be conscious of your limits but you can do that. You can, with the right technique, put in layers and layers of color, just like with paint. Huh. Okay. And that is so fun because, you know, you take colored pencils anywhere. Right, right. Wow. I did not realize. It, it, see, that's uh, the stuff I learned doing these shows. Because, um, yeah, yeah, colored pencil, yeah, I had them. Yep. And <laughs> you needed a different color you just used it but you never think of it as art oh so you can actually build that up oh that's yes. fascinating yeah. yeah 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 so did you do pencil before paint no i did paint before pencil okay did yeah. that help do you think that helped with the with the pencil in understanding absolutely yeah yeah okay. I, be, I think the most challenging thing one learns when painting is simply mixing color to get you know, the value that you want. And that that's always the challenge. And so once I understood how to mix color in in oil or acrylic, it, it became very easy to do it in colored pencil. I, I think if I were to jump to something like watercolor, that would be a, a huge challenge for me because it, it is a different way of thinking and a different um, way of you know, you have to leave the whites white, where in everything I do, I can just add white on later. So yeah. the um, colored pencil is not that different from painting. It's just, it's just a different crayon. Yeah. Yeah, that, that uh, watercolor, I, uh, I was doing some work at the uh, Field Museum, photography work on coral. And uh, yeah, that was, that was fun. Uh, and that uh, Field Museum in Chicago. Um, vast collection of, of all kinds of stuff. I'm sure there's stuff they don't even know they have, but yeah. um, helping them, photographing, helping them catalog uh, the coral, the skeletons that they had. Wow. And then it, it, you're in the room with these, you know, room, you know, it's, it's a giant space with shelves to the ceiling of insects and, you know, all, pre, all these preserved animals that are for study. And, yeah. and there was a lady teaching a class when I, when I was photographing. There was a lady teaching a class on watercolor and painting insects. Yeah. And I have to say that uh, that particular day, I didn't get a lot of photography done because I had to go over and watch. And yeah. I, I was the that to me it was a whole amazing because you you paint and then you have to let that area dry and go to another place and paint. Yeah. And how she built up the colors and could actually get black. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, it was, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> just, oh, what a great experience to have, to have watched that. Yeah. I think scientific illustration is a, is a, it's just, that's, that's what I wanted to be when I started. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, it shows up in your fiber art. So, um, well, thank you. Yeah. All right. So, all right. Set that aside. I got to hear about the wood turning. I am, I mean, I am a sucker for beautifully created and finished wood pieces. And uh, 
so so how how do you have all this paint and and color pencil and now textile art and then over here is is wood turning yeah. and and then the story I read about uh, your your lathe was vibrating too much and you dug out under the workshop and filled it with concrete and <laughs> what was that <laughs> yeah well you, know, you got to do what you got to do <laughs> yeah um yeah no it, it I had, grew up with three brothers and they all had they all had wood shop and would come home with these cute little projects, you know, in high school. And I had home ec. I was still of that generation and right. I was always jealous. So it always it always felt like I got gypped on that one. But um, at one point, I when I had moved to the Chesapeake Bay Area and given up um, my work in science, I was actually I, I bought and ran a yacht charter business for a number of years. And someone when I was um, I sold that business. And when I did, someone owed me money and they called me and said, this is a small town. They called me and said, listen, I don't have the money to pay you, but I put something on your front lawn. It's yours. Well, I went out <laughs> and literally on the grass in my front yard was a wood lathe. I knew what it was, but I had no idea how to use it. And so back then, you know, I went to the library, right, and looked it up on books and I fell in love with it because um, wood turning is just like doing pottery on a wheel, except that every single piece of wood is different and you mm -hmm. don't know what you're going to get. Kind of like Forrest Gump, you know, it, 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 the chocolates all look the same, but who knows what's inside. And so I love ceramic work and ceramic work on a wheel, but but the clay is consistent. And so when you turn, it's the same feeling of taking a big clump and turning it round, you use sharp tools instead of your hands to do it. But what comes of it really speaks to you from the wood's perspective, because you don't know what's in there when you get a big chunk of wood. Uh -huh. And that's, um, to me, that was always the magic. So, so it's like the sculptor. There's a, there's a bowl in there. You just yeah. got to bring it out. Right. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, that was just a, a you know, a, a, lucky thing that I, that I got to do for, for a number of years. And, um, um, even you, have a piece. I mean, you, you were yeah. quite serious. You got recognized and all kinds of things for your work. I mean, it's, yeah. it's gorgeous. Holy smokes. Thank you. Thank you. But now, uh, I, so you, you didn't have any experience. You had learned, had to learn how to turn and, uh, use all the knives and things, but then there's wood finishing. You yeah. teach yourself all of that. Well, you know, you teach yourself and you and you you read. And uh, luckily, about that time in my life, video became available, uh, and so mm -hmm. you could rent videos back then. Um, so, so there was, and I and I went to workshops. Um, you know, I just um, I love to learn, and so there was just you know, if you if you love to learn and you just reach out, people are happy to share. And I think artists in particular are remarkable people in terms of their willingness to share everything that they know. Um, unlike the world of science, which, which is <laughs> a slightly different. And so I, um, slightly. I found, <laughs> you know, if I had a question, I could find the answer. Someone was willing to share with me how, how to do things. And, and then the other thing is you just plain can't be afraid. You just, who cares if you make a mistake, um, do it anyway. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. The uh so so you literally uh, literally did dig out underneath the thing and the Yeah. The... <laughs> I did. So my first lathe, yeah, I bought I bought my first lathe and I built the table to put the lathe on cuz I I couldn't buy a real big lathe that had a table, you know, it had a stand with it. So I built the stand out of 2 by 4s um laid on their sides, big heavy table. And then started turning it, but I kept turning larger and larger pieces, and that got to be too much for this little lathe. Oh. So it dawned on me that if I maybe if I poured some concrete down under the shop, and and put some posts through there, that that would really hold it <laughs> in place. And uh, so yeah, it, it did. It worked. It worked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what the heck? Yeah. 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 You, you make do with what you have. Yeah. So so. You don't do much of that anymore. Is it is it an escape for you or just another art form? Oh, it's so gosh. different from painting and colored pencil and textile art that it. 
everything to me that has to do with art is an escape. It's it's it when I'm sewing, I feel like I'm in that other world. You know, when I'm turning, I'm in that other world. Um, I just it's a it's a step out of reality. Whatever it is that the art form is for me, they they all produce that same incredible feeling of I don't even know what time it is. I don't know how long I've been here. I just am in this space, you know, making something. And to me, that's like the happy place. So so you literally go into that meditative zone of creation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You could probably come in the room and say my name and I wouldn't answer. So, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we've done shows on how meditative just pure needlework is and yes uh, you, you just your mind relaxes your body relaxes and you yeah you just go away yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely and that's the draw and yeah. then in the end you have this wonderful piece of something that you made that will live outlive you and that um you made while you were in that beautiful place yep yeah all right so take us through the the textile art part how do sure. you what is the transition from paint and watercolor and and we'll share some some of your some of those photos because they're or images because they're beautiful. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, it really it's not like you're <laughs> not like you're a rookie at it. You're it's they're really really nice to look at. I really enjoyed all of the all of your stuff. But thank you. How how do you transfer to textile art? I mean, that is again a very different medium. It is, but I just um, I don't once you see the world in terms of of color and values and shading, then it doesn't matter whether you're using chalk or charcoal or pencil or, for me, using fabric instead of paint. So, so, so for me, um, the fabric that I use, what I'll, I'll explain the process. I, I love to do realistic animals. But I've always wanted to break out of realism and and expand it into something richer. And, and I thought one day, if I used fabric as my values, my lights and my darks, and didn't worry about the pattern or the color of the fabric, but just how light or dark it is, and just cut it with scissors and plunk it down on a drawing of, say, I don't know, a cougar or a horse or a bird, and, and just lay out the values, light and dark, with this mixture of fabrics. And then with the sewing machine, that to me is almost like going back with colored pencil and drawing the realism back in, just based on top of those values. So what I do is just start with a, a piece of um, cotton fabric um, or linen, and I just sketch with a pencil like you would sketching anything else. And just sketch the outline of whatever it is I'm doing. And then I walk to my fabrics, which I have laid out in piles from light to dark. Just completely in a pile from light to dark. So there's, you know, it doesn't matter that it's yellow or purple. If it's real pale color, that's my light. <laughs> okay. You know, and my, my dark. So I will then walk over to that place where I've laid out all my fabrics. And I'll pick a light, a dark, and a middle. And maybe one or two in between, above the middle and below, below the middle. Mm -hmm. And I'll take whatever seven fabrics I chose, and I put the others away, and I make myself use that. That's my palette. And I the, that's the one rule I follow. I'm required to then use whatever the heck I just picked up. Oh, and and okay. that, that way, the style of these pieces really happens organically on its own by just having made that decision. So then that prevents you from getting bogged down into 50 different shades of cloth and all of Yes. Yeah, I just don't go there. I just I want that first part just values to be the only thing that matters and then when I stitch, I stitch right on top of those and then I can stitch in the detail and I can blend in, you know, one fabric into another fabric where there is, you know, a change of value in the animal. But um that's that's the whole process right there. Hmm. It's so interesting that you, you you I can see you limit yourself, and that allow to me at least that's what I'm hearing is that allows you to move forward. 
yes. Yes, or you could you could honestly get stuck there. So, yeah. so that was the one rule I made for myself. I once I've chosen those fabrics, I go with whatever I chose. And and sometimes when you first look at a group of fabrics you chose, if you really did it with, by just value, you know, light, a dark, a medium, you've got purple, you got green, you got reds, you've got maybe little racing cars, and you might have you know little squiggles on another, or you might have. Um, uh, little animals or something in the fabric. So it the, the pattern and the color doesn't matter. It's just the value. And yeah, okay. that, that, that one and only trick frees you up completely because then you just say, okay, this is what I have to work with. And Cause then, that was, that was my, that was my next question then was what about the prints on the fabric and the color? So, so you, your mind just erases that. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Okay. Yeah. And what fun that has been. So it, 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 for the first time in my life, I really am doing, I use my tendency toward realism in the work, but the work based on the way I've started it makes it less than, you know, it's not realism. It is something that has moved beyond simple realism and has a depth to it and a story to it that's really brought on solely by the fabrics themselves. And that's just, I let that happen. So purchasing fabric. Yeah. What, so how do you go about that? I mean, is, is it the same process? Um, purchasing fabric is, you know, you get to be my agent, even if you were never a sewer, you, you've got stashes of fabric. Oh, okay. What I, what I learned, however. <laughs> you have that I problem. Learned, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not, I'd not throw away anything kind of person. But what I learned is that some fabrics won't hold up to the amount of stitching that I do. Oh. So I, I have learned to get a little bit particular about um, the fabrics that I use. So I, I generally, given the opportunity, will use um, Liberty of London fabric, which is a very tight um, fabric, all out of cotton and it's available on Etsy. You know, people have everyone that has ever used Liberty of London fabrics has a stash of them somewhere. And eventually, you know, if they, they want to get rid of their stash, I just collect bits of other people's stashes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you don't have to do that for very long. And, and, and all of a sudden you've got a lot of variety. Uh, yeah. And I'm sure a lot of them. Please take it. <laughs> just... <laughs> I get a lot of that. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I mean, that's in the needlework world. That's one of those ongoing growing problems is, is when people pass away, what do you do with the stash? Yes. And, and, you know, people who are the heart just can't throw it away. So you no. got to give it a new home and same uh, with woodworking. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that, so then you just, you, so you have the stash. It's not a matter of, uh, I want to do this project. So I got to go out and buy a bunch of uh, fabric. Yeah. You have it. Yeah. 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 And then, all right. So, so we, we have the fat, uh, it's fascinating. So, so there's a draw, the drawing is on a base ground cloth then it's yeah. not on paper. Correct. Okay. And then, and then the cloths go on that, the pieces go on that. Now, when, when you're cutting the pieces, is there a plan there or does that just kind of evolve as you work on it? Well, generally, so I guess I didn't describe it completely appropriately. I do do a sketch on paper um, so that I can kind of think about what I'm going to do. So I'll kind of sketch on paper. Then I'll take that paper sketch, put it on my cloth, just oh, okay. in terms of literally just looking at it and just redrawing it. Um, but that way I can use the paper to go to get a sense of how I want the fabric shapes to be cut. And I, again, I do it just based on value where I'll look at the, an image of, um, let's say, uh, uh, a great blue heron. And I just ask myself, where's the darkest dark? And where are the lightest lights? And then I'll just snip little bits of my darkest fabric and my lightest fabric, and I'll just stick them down with a little glue stick on the drawing. And then I'll go to, okay, where's the medium color? And, and where is that? And I just do that until it's done. And I try and make that a pretty speedy process so I don't get too bogged down in, in that because that's, 
that's I, I have to let that do its own thing. If mm -hmm. I get I, you could really get bogged down and think this doesn't go with that and maybe I shouldn't do this here. But if you can just get all those fabrics down and then to me, the sewing is the drawing part. And that's the part that seems natural to me is to just go ahead and then draw with your sewing machine what you see. Yeah. So, so the the fabric part then, uh, what what I'm hearing is is almost kind of a stained glass with with cloth. Yeah, exactly, precisely. Okay. Yeah, almost like a collage, you know, or you can do it with paper too, you know, where you just rip paper and do lights and darks. Yeah. Is is there a lot of trial and error there, or do you let the abstract aspect just come in and? Yeah, there are no errors. There are no errors. You just do it. I don't, I don't, I don't uh, there is no such thing as mistakes. For me, if you, um, yeah, everything is just, how do you, how do you involve this in what you're making? So how do you use what you have to make what you want? And I don't, I don't take threads out. I don't take, you know, anything. I generally don't ever go back and change anything. Huh. So that's the challenge, but it's also what makes it, unique and special yeah. and so uh, you just have to accept that that's the challenge that you face and let it be that's so interesting because it's so easy in needlework to get bogged down in details mm -hmm. and your system just is full steam ahead yeah 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 huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm not good with precise and um i i appreciate that kind of work but i've never been really good at it i just i always am thinking of the end um and where i'm heading not how i got there too much so opposite end of the spectrum from uh science wow <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah two very si healthy <laughs> two sides of the brain yeah exactly <laughs> all right so then then you get all these pieces they're just glue stick down and then yeah. and then now we go to the sewing machine yep yeah and the, and the feed dogs are off on the sewing machine, so you can just move the fabric however you want. Exactly. Yep. And, and, and straight straight stitch. Don't don't touch any buttons. Don't touch any <laughs> buttons. I, yeah, I don't know what those buttons do. Just straight stitch, feed dog down, and um, and just think of it. If I think of it as sewing, I will be intimidated because I didn't do well in home ec. But if I think of it as painting, and I think there there's my there's my crayon, you know, this color thread, um, then that's, that's how I think of it as painting. I just think I'm starting to paint on the fabrics. Well, you set, you set some very definite boundaries in your mind to yeah. keep you from wandering off into things that are not going to help you. That's yes. interesting. Yes. Yeah. I learned early on that I, I, I knew myself well enough to know and with things like fabric, there's, I think of fabric as a, cray, a box of crayons, but because they have color and pattern, you're, it's the biggest box of crayons on the planet. <laughs> and if you keep second guessing which crayon you chose, you will never get the work done. So I make myself choose a few crayons and that's it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I'm I'm really enjoying this because uh, I had a vision of you sitting down with a, a room full of fabrics laid out, trying to decide which one, and I thought, wow, what a process! I'm getting a headache. And, yeah, uh, you I eliminate all that. Yes. Huh. Yep. <laughs> so, so then, with the sewing machine, so let's take the the great blue heron. Then that's where the eye comes in, and the feather yes. definition, and all those things. Yes. So that's when I feel like then I'm I'm drawing. So I will almost always start with the eye and just, you know, work just just so like I'm drawing, uh, you know, just so the eye from the center out. Uh huh. That's you know, like, it, you know, OK. That interests me, too, because uh, at one time I was doing an awful lot of photography as all wildlife photography and a, 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 a master photographer said to me one day, if you're shooting animals, I don't care what you do with your settings or your depth of field or anything, make sure that eyes in focus because that's yes. all that matters. Yes. And that's where you start. Okay. And it was always what I did when I did portrait work. 
Uh-huh. Um, if I could, if I could get that eye correct, then I knew that I could sit with you know that that human being that was coming up on the canvas for however many weeks it took because I because once the eye is right, then the rest it just falls into place. It yeah. drives the process. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and in and with fabric, it's great to have a, a focal point that you start in. And then move out from because that fabric does, you know, start to pucker and starts, you know, I've have some batting, I have some layers of batting under the fabric, just to give it some depth. And again, when you sew like that, you've got to start from a center point and go and sew out mm-hmm. from that, so you don't get everything bunched up. Yeah. So I just start with the eye. And then, all right. So then we're changing colors of thread all the time, according all to all the time. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. And, you know, that's another one where you just have to say to yourself, I love changing the bobbin thread. I love this. No, you don't. Nobody <laughs> no, loves changing the bobbin it, thread. <laughs> but you say it anyway because, um, you know, and you turn the radio up loud and sing the song or whatever and change the thread because I, yeah, I'm always changing threads all the time. You know, it's just um, it's just part of the process. It's not, it's not the speediest thing in the world, but... Um, but yeah, you change threads all the time. Hate bobbin threads. <laughs> no, well, and and I um, I have some uh, vintage sewing machine singers that I'm oh, yeah. uh, uh, redoing, and but where and and the bobbin the bobbin part for anybody that does those is one of the toughest things. Getting them clean, getting them back together, getting yeah, all the things. Those especially that, those old singers. Yeah, yeah, that mechanism is the bane of any sewing machine. I'm convinced of it. <laughs> Just, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. So then, uh, so then I'm seeing, I'm seeing off to the side here, uh, instead of oil paint or your your uh, pen, colored pencils, I'm seeing all these threads. This is your palette. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then, and then it just it's just free form. Uh, yep. Put the foot down and just go. Yeah, yeah, which is super fun. Yeah, and you know, and so you could say that I make mistakes all day long, but to me, it's just like with anything else. You just so you just stitch over it. You know, yeah. you just you know. So if I went too far with this feather or this you know, whatever, part of the the animal, just you just redraw with more thread. Right. And, well, uh, yeah, and it's nature. So if you make it too perfect, it looks fake. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Which, yeah. Which is crazy, but it's true. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a great point. So, all right. So you just go, and then, uh, wow, that's so cool because it it really comes out. It works. It's amazing. It's, it seems to work. <laughs> <laughs> now I see that you uh, most most of your work is uh, is animals. Uh, so a lot of Chesapeake Bay and surrounding area, uh, wildlife, your influence. Yes. yes. That's my influence. Um, you know, I've only, this is just the third year that I've been doing this and that was really, that, that was what drew me in, um, whether or not I might expand over time to do other things. I, I won't rule it out, but there is so much richness yeah. to the, the wildlife in, in this place part of the country that and and you know we're losing it so quickly um with climate change and and other reasons that it seems a beautiful thing to capture just as a photographer could spend their entire life photographing the wildlife of a certain area i really think that i could stick with this and probably be pretty happy here yeah yeah i think uh people in other parts of the country uh don't have a full appreciation of that chesapeake bay area the flora, fauna, ecology, the whole bit is, it's a special area. Yeah. It is very much. Uh, that needs to be preserved. And yes, I wish people worked harder at it. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, and, and when I show the work, I always talk about the, um, the, uh, environmental concerns that this animal faces and you know what its population is and what it used to be and what we can do about it so i always ha- try and have that story with mm-hmm. with the piece because if you bring people in and entertain them with the with the a visual then it's kind of nice to then say in fact you know we can talk about this animal and let's talk about why it's important yeah oh yeah well and that's that's the power that's where your art has power yeah yes right true appreciation yep Yes. Yeah. 
Now, okay, so you talked about putting some some padding in, and in some of your uh, of your pieces, there there is some three D uh, relief, some beading, and some other things. And not a lot, but uh, is that an evolving thing in in terms of your art? How much of that to put in? Um, well, I've all. Uh... With each piece, for the most part, I use a little bit of a cotton batting and, you know, and some fabric behind that, almost like you do for a quilt. Um, don't use any beads or anything okay. like that. That would be fun, but that that would probably take me in a whole other direction. So <laughs> it looked um, like it looked like there was some some of that in there, but no. There there was a period of time when I was doing some kind of playful work like that, but in this work that I'm currently doing, I don't. Don't go there because I know I could get lost in, in the, the myriad of things that you could do with. That's so much fun. Um, so I just use um, my cotton fabrics um, and cotton batting, and that's it, and cotton thread. Mm, simple. Again, those parameters that allow you to move forward. Yes, yeah, so mm. that I don't get don't get stuck in in uh, you know small things just it's it kind of just setting up some rules about what i will limit so that i don't get lost yeah <laughs> no, so one project at a time or do you have multiples going always multiples okay always multiples um i always did that painting as well that it just sometimes you can look at a person or an animal for only so long and then you kind of get cross-eyed if you just put it away and choose another one and come back to it whenever two hours later two weeks later you you can look at it anew so i i always have three three or four at a time okay okay what fun now is are you one of those artists who has so many ideas in your head that you can't get to them fast enough yes that's um yes and so, you know, sometimes I just have to talk myself out of that. You ah. know, don't, you know, just, you know, just <laughs> take it easy. <laughs> you can do that next week. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, people we've talked, I've talked to artists like that. You know, I can almost sense a frustration. Yeah. If I had 36 hour days um, yes. and, and didn't have to sleep, I would, uh, I would keep going because I, I need to get these out of my head and, and down. On, yes. on whatever the medium is, yes. Yes, yeah, I think many of us suffer from that, and uh, so you learn to manage that. Yeah. All right, so then uh, exhibitions, art shows, and I assume these are juried art shows. Uh, yes, so um, it, when COVID was going on and I was playing with this whole experimental idea, I, I, I didn't show my work to anyone, and so over that period of two years, I produced a, a number of pieces, uh, probably about 20 large pieces and um, decided to enter into a show. And I didn't know much about, I hadn't entered shows since I was a wood turner 30 years before that. So I, um, I entered a local, small local show and got just a really lovely reception from people looking at the work and people that came to that show suggested to me that I should do other shows. So, um, so from a small uh, local show. I, w I then applied to the Waterfowl Festival, which is a big show that we have on the Eastern Shore that has never had fiber work before. And they were kind enough to allow me into that show. So I did the um, Waterfowl Festival last year and just people loved it. Um, you know, if it was a ch another way to appreciate wildlife, it was just so a different perspective. So that, that show is what probably oil paint, watercolor, yes. the more, more conventional things. So you broke some ground there. I did. And they, and, and I'm, I'm so pleased that they were willing to, you know, step out of the box a little bit to, to allow me to do that. Because I think, I think there, there are so many more art forms than just, you know, just photography, um, um, in, in their case, it's either, I think you can do sculpture, photography, and painting. So I called myself a thread painter, and I applied <laughs> as a painter. Mm -hmm. And there was a little bit of pushback, no doubt, but yeah. then they, the judges asked if they could come see my work. So I actually um, left my work um, at a gallery with a friend and let them come and look at it when I wasn't there. 
And the next thing I knew, they they let me in the show. I think they thought, oh, we you you can do this. You know, you yeah. can you can represent animals in this art form. So um, hopefully that that spreads to to lots more art forms being used in that kind of show. Um, and then from that show, I did the Smithsonian um, show this last May, and that was fantastic and um, great fun. And um, just have been getting some calls from some, like the World Bank in DC has called, and I'm going to write a proposal for them after I get off this call with you that they they'd like to have some of that work in their um building in dc so each thing you do kind of leads to the next opportunity Mm -hmm. and i'm just grateful for that yeah so commission work or try to stay away from that um i'm happy to do commission work i really am i haven't been asked to do any but i did portrait work that way obviously and 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 i love doing it um Mm -hmm. as long as they they let me kind of decide how it's going to go and what it's going to look like. So, for example, when I would do a portrait of, say, a 10 year old child, I would come over to the house and I would just photograph that child playing all afternoon. And I would tell the, the, the parents, I'm not going to show you this until it's done. I'm not going to show you what I chose for a photo. I'm not going to show you how I painted. I'm not going to show you the size of the you just have to trust me. And if you don't want it when it's done, that's fine. Hmm. And uh, that has always worked out well for me. So if I, if I were asked to do that, I might, if someone said they specifically wanted me to do, say, a buffalo or a beloved pet um, or or a portrait of a, of, of a beloved person, I would be happy to do that, but they wouldn't see any of it until it was done because it, I can't have another voice yeah. in, in that creation. Yeah, that's the thing about commission work is I can't imagine doing that as an artist. It, yeah, you'd have to set some parameters, yes. but you've you got to have that freedom or you can't create your art. Yes, you really do. And I learned that early on um, with portraiture because, uh, you know, parents can be very picky and you don't want them to come in in the middle of a portrait and say, well, can you make his hair like fluff a little bit more this way? No, that's not what I see. That's not what I'm doing. (laughs) So you just if you if you um, don't show them until the work is done, that's when they can fully appreciate it. Generally, a lot of uh, uh, not generally, but many people have difficulty seeing a work in progress or in process and understanding that you will get there. You're just not there yet because it gets pretty muddy in the middle yeah yeah and your mind doesn't need that intrusion no right yeah yeah all right we got to end up i got to hear the story about the ornament at the white house oh oh um well that was just um that was just a lovely thing so i was uh doing wood turning on the side then um i had i was running a business as well but on the side i was doing this wood turning and i had entered um an art show with with a couple of pieces and the the judge at that show was the head of the Renwick Gallery in DC and uh, she called me sometime later and asked if I would provide a piece for the White House that year which was going to have a Christmas tree that was filled with uh, craft it was it was it was the year of American craft and I was asked if I would offer a piece. So I, so I did get that opportunity. So I, I turned a piece for the white house. Yeah. <laughs> That's so neat. Now, do, do those stay at the white house? They stay. Yes. I'm sure they're in a box somewhere in the back of somewhere in the, in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Uh, you know, but, yeah. uh, I always have visions of the, the end of the original and Indiana Jones, uh, movie. I don't know if you saw it, but yeah, just this massive basement of just, Ancient artifacts, yeah. Yes, I remember that scene. It's a great scene. That's <laughs> well said. Exactly. Yeah. Packed All away great carefully. Museums are like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Susan, thanks so much, and congratulations to you and Gail on uh, on the new gallery. I'm really looking forward to see what you guys do with that. It's going to be, uh, I'm sure, spectacular. And uh, the fact that it's just such an evolving thing every ten weeks is just going to be so neat. So, congratulations, and thanks for doing this. Thank you, Gary. I very much appreciate the opportunity. It's been delightful. All right, and thanks, everyone, for listening. <laughs>